How many have been taken captive by a drug or by whatever, you know? You were taken captive. We didn't have you. But let me tell you what my God does. He, lead, he leads captivity captive. And he sets you free from the bad stuff and takes you captive with the good stuff. You used to be a slave to sin. Now you're becoming a slave to righteousness. Amen? And he'll take you captive. He'll captivate your heart. That's the only way this works, you guys. Is you got to be captivated. You got to fall in love, not religion, but a relationship. Amen? Amen. And so today, you know, my goal is to get you out of the wilderness to take your place at the Father's house. Amen. And there's people all around that probably don't even know they have a place. I don't think they qualify. I don't think they're worthy. I don't think they're good enough. And somebody's got to get the good news to them. That my father's got a place at his table for them. With their name on it. I talked about it last week. And as I was thinking about this week, I couldn't help but go to a story that, that I really felt God wants me to teach on. I've done it a little bit before, but I just feel like it fits with what I've been talking. Remember I talked to you the last two weeks about the parable of the great meal, the supper, and how the father who represented God made this great banquet. His son, his, his, the bread of life, the new wine from heaven. And he said, I got this glorious meal prepared for you. Come, it's all ready. It's done. And then those that were supposed to come didn't come. And so there was so much room. He said, okay, go out and get the lame and the blind. Anybody ever been broken? Anybody ever feel like, and he said, go get the lame and the blind, the ones that never got invited to the party. There's something wrong with them. And they went and got those, and there was still room. He said, okay. Now I want you to go to the highways and the hedges. Go over there to those Samaritans. Remember that? Go over there to those folks that, that are the outcasts. They call them the dogs. They would say dogs. And by the way, that was us, Gentiles. That was us. And we got invited to the party. And he said, but you're going to have to compel them to come because they don't think they're good enough and they don't think they qualify. They have been rejected their whole life in many cases. And they're saying, don't mess with me. I talk about that life. Don't mess with me like that. Don't tell me this because I've already been broken a million times. And, and I, I can't, you know, and how many of that people, remember I talk about the wounded lover syndrome? I'm not going to give my heart away again because every time I've given my heart away, every time I've trusted somebody, they let me down. And so I'm just going to build my walls. And when you build your wall, remember last week? You imprison yourself. And you cannot fulfill your destiny when you've imprisoned yourself in that wall. And you think you're protecting yourself, and you probably are, but you're stopping yourself from your destiny. And at some point, you guys, you're going to have to let the walls down. And it has to start this way, not this way. With the trust of your Father. That man, if he says I can come, I can come. If he gives me an invitation, it's a good invitation. Amen? Amen. And there's people out there, and hopefully the story today will help you understand that. So if you have any Bibles, we're going to go to the Old Testament. Because I know all through the Old Testament, God painted pictures of the New. And, and this is a beautiful testament of the New Testament. And how many thank God for the Old Testament? But how many of we got the New Testament? And they work together. Everything in the Old pointed to Jesus, ahead to Jesus. Everything in the New points back to Jesus. I mean, that Jesus is the center. But we see the beautiful story of the gospel, this Old Testament story. And David was a type of Jesus, amen? A shadow of Jesus. And so let's just read it first, and then I'm going to share a few things. I've got four things I'm going to share with you. But 2 Samuel chapter 9, and they'll probably put it up on there. And I'm just going to read, try, try to read it before I preach. It says, let's, just, let's read the story. This is an amazing story. We're going to talk about Mephibosheth, okay? And by the way, I looked up his name. And his name, the meaning of his name is tied to shame. Anybody ever feel like that you've been stopped by shame? And, and, or, you know, just not feeling worthy enough that was kind of tied to his name, Mephibosheth. But anyway, it says in verse 1, it says, Now David said, Is there still one, anyone, who is left in the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness? It was a kindness. For Jonathan's sake. For there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show kind, the kindness of God? 
And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of, of Jonathan who, who is lame in his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Bacar, the son of Amiel, in, in Lodabar. And the king David sent and brought him out of the house of Mekar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Bethibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. And then David said, Bethibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear. I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, uh, Saul's servant, and he said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all, and all, to all his house. You therefore and your son and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. And now Ziba had, had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, one more time, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. There's a place at the table for you. And I'm just absolutely convinced, you guys, there's a whole world out there that would love to come. Would love to come. But they don't think they qualify. They don't think they're worthy. They, they're like the Thibosheth. What are you doing coming to a dead dog like me? Anybody ever been there and done that? How could anybody love me? How could anybody choose me? After what I've done, what I've done to God, what I've done to my family, and I know like, and how many know the devil will beat you down? People will beat you down. Some guys will tell their girls, you're just lucky I don't know you. But some girls do that to a guy too, so you know, <laughs> those are I mean, no, that's the truth, isn't it? Yes. They're like, man, you're lucky anybody loves you. You're lucky anybody put up with you. Am I right about that? Yep. <laughs> and I'm telling you guys, I feel like this thing's about to bust loose. If we could just go and take some good news and say, I don't know you ain't gonna believe this. And my daddy, he said, he's got a place at his table for you. Amen. You know, get out of here. Don't mess with me like that. My heart's already been, no, this is true. I'm not kidding, you guys. You don't have to compel them, because they don't believe it. Because their heart's been broken a million times. Crushed. You're not talking into it, amen? So let me just talk to you about a few things here. And... And uh, number one, everybody say covenant. 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 See, if you go back to verse one, it says that David said, Is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? What's up with that? The word kindness there literally is the word covenant faithfulness. In other words, David is in a covenant with Jonathan. But how many of you know we live under the new covenant? And how many know that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I can enter into a covenant with God? And when you enter into that covenant, it is forever. Amen? Amen. It is forever. Okay? And let me show you what happens in a covenant. Real quick, just turn to your left. Go back to 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 4. And, and I want to see, I'll show you what happened with Jonathan and David. It's an amazing story. And you go put up here. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as he loved his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house. I'm talking about David anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Verse 4. And Jonathan took his robe that was on him and gave it to David his armor 
and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And see, and, and I know, uh, I know Daryl likes to teach on covenant, but if you don't know about covenant, I'm going to go, the covenant I'm talking about is with our God, amen? But it's also with each other. But when they gave you a robe, that is full of authority. So everything I have is yours. And they exchanged robes. And then it says they exchanged swords. And they, you know, the weaponry. And basically what, when you're in a covenant with somebody, if, if you're at war, I'm at war. Amen? If somebody's coming after you, then that means they're coming after me too. Amen? And, and if I have something that you need, or you have something that I need, we're in covenant together. Amen? It was a beautiful thing. And Jonathan, and if you, if you read the story, it was Jonathan that found out that his own dad saw. This is all messed up. I'm going to go to the Bible. That's crazy stories. This is messed up. But Jonathan's own father saw, got jealous of David. Remember he threw the spear at him twice? And, and, and so how many know? So Jonathan was the one because of the covenant with David that went more than David. You better get out of here because my dad wants to kill me. And really saved his life. And David never forgot because he was in covenant. Can I tell you guys, God never forgets. God never forgets. We're in covenant. When you've accepted Jesus Christ, you enter into covenant. And God says, your fight is my fight. Amen? What I have is yours. What you have is mine. That's what covenant's all about. And so, and so that's, what, that's why David says, is there anybody? See, and, and see we're going to see that when you're in covenant, let me tell you, let me go one step farther. When you're in covenant, your kids are my kids. And my kids are your kids. And I remember that time I grew up, you know, kids sitting from church. Cheryl remembers this. Remember the, I won't say their name, but our neighbors down the street. I remember, like, back in the day, and we go straight to jail for this day, but that's probably what's wrong with our country a little bit. But I would go over to my neighbor's house, and they had lots of kids, and if you was over there, you was one of their kids. If they was over in our house, we was, they were one of our kids. And if you got in trouble at their house, and the father lined them up to get a belt, which he did, guess who was in the line too? I was. And then he said, man, you're my kid, you messed up, I'm going to swat you just like I swat the rest of them. I mean, that's probably needed the part to say that, because it's not politically correct. But I think that might be what's missing a little bit in the world today. You know, but, but, but I didn't say, say I mean, my kids are your kids. And so when David finally gets the throne, and, and if you read just before this, he brings that tabernacle of David in the ark, and everything settles down, and then he goes back to the covenant, and he says, is there anyone left in Jonathan's family that I can keep my covenant? And he went looking for the covenant child. God went looking for us. See, some people think they found Jesus, but can I tell you what? You didn't find Jesus. Jesus found you. Amen. So they said, oh, I found God. No, you didn't. I found you. Amen. And some of you was in my life. He found me. He can find some strange places, can he? Some strange places. But, so the first thing that I want you to see is covenant. You see, to me, I believe that's a spiritual event where our hearts are knit together in love. Just like Jonathan and David. It's like Jonathan and David. Where you know you take a bullet for them and they take a bullet for you. I mean that's 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 what we're after, you know. So that's the first thing I want you to see is coming. But then there's something unique about uh Mephibosheth, okay? And the second thing I want you to see that he was wounded, okay? And it says in verse number three, it says, Then the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul who may show who may show kindness to God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Okay? And I want to talk about that for a minute because to me this is very, like, very important. And my wife talked about it a little bit. I didn't know she was going to be saying that. But, but how many of you know, I want to talk to you not necessarily about this being lame physically, but how many of you know you can be lame spiritually? See, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to talk to you about what, you know, I look up the word lame. How many ever use the word, that was lame? When you say lame, you, just, you know what you're saying. Like, it, that's, that's wimpy. That's weak. Or whatever you want to say, you know, that was lame. You know, it's like, and how many of there's almost a negative attachment to that already? Yeah. See, Jesus said, well, go out in the highways and the byways and bring the lame. Now, I'm not talking about physical, guys. 
I'm talking about we've all been wounded. We've all been dropped. And if you don't know the story of the Dimashev, it's very interesting. But, it's, but let me tell you what feet lay means. It means to be feeble. means, uh, I wrote down, infection from reject, rejection. Anybody ever been rejected? You know, one thing I heard this week. How many believe you've been called to the ministry? To my job to equip who? The saints to do the work of the lot. And I heard this this week. When you get called, when you take the call to the ministry, you are, you are taking the call to chronic rejection. Especially if you're going to be a pastor. But everybody, how many, if I ask how many feel like you've ever been rejected, how many raise your hand right now? See, it's, it's in the world, isn't it? And, and let me tell you. And, and, and if you get a chance to go listen to Darius, this amazing sermon called Infection of Rejection. And we've all been infected. And, and, and it'll mess you up. But anyway, so Mephibosheth was wounded. And here's how it happened. When he was just a little boy, just a little boy, was the story of Saul trying to kill David. And Jonathan was losing his dad, Saul, out trying to kill David. And David, you know the story how David ran from Saul all this crazy time? And so finally the day come when the news came back to the palace where Mephibosheth was just a little boy and Saul was the king and Jonathan was in line to take the throne. Guess who else was in line to take the throne? Mephibosheth. He was in the lineage of the king. And how many know the custom was that when, uh, when a territory was conquered, that all the reigning family would be killed? Why? Because they feared that lineage to the throne. And so the word comes back from the, where they were battling, the battlegrounds, that Saul had been killed. And Jonathan, his father, was killed. And when the word came back to the palace, Bethlehem was a little boy. And great fear went through the whole palace. You can imagine, couldn't you? Because they're like, hey, we got to get out of here because King Saul's dead. Jonathan is dead. David's coming to town. And the tradition is he's going to kill everybody in the lineage of Saul. And every bit of competition is going to be taken out. And so fear, everybody say fear. Fear. Fear came upon the household. And so the servant that was taking care of Mephibosheth scoops up the little boy and takes off running, fleeing from David. Because in their mind, they're thinking he wants to kill us. And they're running for their lives. And while they were running, she dropped him. And she, he fell and crippled both of his feet. And he was crippled the rest of his life. But what I want to talk about is how many of us have been dropped spiritually? How many of us have run from things that weren't even real? We're just a perception in our mind. And we got dropped. And we got wounded. And we became spiritually lame or broken. Or we got infected by rejection. And let me tell you, when you're infected, when you're offended, it messes everything up. It'll harden your heart. I mean, it'll hurt people, hurt people. Right. Bitter people make people bitter. Amen. Angry people want to make other people angry. Amen. And it's that infection on the inside of you of unforgiveness. And by the way, the only way to even start the healing process is you got to forgive. Right. You got to forgive, you guys. I don't care how wrong it was. It's like drinking poison and think it's going to hurt somebody else. It's killing you. And unforgiveness, let me just tell you, it attaches to you the very thing you hate. You don't wonder why you can't get anywhere where you're because you're dragging around all that dead stuff. You got your chain to it because you won't forgive. You're still bitter. You still harbor unforgiveness in your heart. You think, yeah, they hurt me. Yeah, it's killing you. It's keeping you from your destiny. I'm all right about that. Okay? So, so anyway, you know, that he's got this mindset. And you can see it in verse 8. Skip over to verse 8. It's, this is his mindset. He said, like, 
Then he, then he bowed down before David and he said, what is, what is your servant that you should even look upon me? You ever feel like that? I'm worthless. He said, such a dead dog as I. You ever been beat down that far? Well, man, I'm like, no good. Nobody's going to want me. Why would you want to talk to such a dead dog as I? I don't know. Has anybody like, ever been down that path a little bit? Yeah. Okay, thank God. I didn't know if I was talking to the right crowd here this morning. You know, because it's happened to us all, isn't it? You know, and, and, and let me just tell you, and that will keep you from your destiny. You will not go occupy your promised land. You will not possess your land when you're living and hiding out in Lodabar with stinking thinking. When you're supposed to be sitting in the palace ruling and reigning. You're out in the wilderness somewhere in Lodabar thinking somebody's trying to kill you when all they really want to do is bless you. See, there are so many people that God's after them not to bring them to the palace, but to kill them, make them a French fry. You better think I was going to make you a French fry and get God with you. The way he's living, the way he's acting. You see what I'm saying? So, so you know, it happens all the time. You know, the Bible says the wicked man, and this is Proverbs 28.1, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And, and how many of I used to be like the wrong way to be? You know, I've smoked a lot of pot, I used to drive around and Car Wayne told me. And, and, and you know how you know how that goes, don't you? Like, there are people pursuing you even when they're in. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody hear the word paranoid? Yeah. Yeah. In our world around here, this drug world, man, there are people in the closets, people on the roof, people in the house. You know, they're everywhere out to get me. You know, they're paranoid. See, the wicked man flees when no one pursues. But the righteous have peace. Enjoy. Man, I could pick out the police car with the bus on me. You know, I knew that police car. Cherry Bell, Kansas. I knew those little square lights. I still have that six cent going on me about 40 some years later. Uh, I could pick out a police car. But the wicked say, I was always looking over my shoulder. I was thinking, they're out to get me. They're out to get me. They're out to get me. But isn't it nice? He said, hey, Go ahead, check the trunk, do whatever you want to do. Yeah. I got nothing to hide. Amen? I'm free in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. So, but anyway, I know, that, I know that's a little further than I probably should have known. But, but, but anyway, say, how many know, like, oh, all the time we're fleeing from a false perception. All the time we're fleeing from bad information, you guys. Anybody get some bad info? You know, I'm going to show you something. I have to put this up here. And, and, and I, I learned this from also Darius Daniels, because he's one of my favorite teachers. Uh, but anyway, how many know everybody has right over here? Let me make this a little longer. This is going to help somebody, so hang in there. Everybody say belief system. In other words, your belief system is what you choose. Everybody say you choose. Now, now, when you're young, you don't get to choose. But when you're in this room right now, you get to choose now. But when you were young, you didn't get to choose your belief system. You were born into a belief system many times. Am I right about that? And I tell people, uh, you know, if you were born in a smoky house, it is impossible for you to come out not smelling like smoke. But here's the thing. Your belief system, how you believe, it's going to believe to your, uh, your emotional condition. Anybody ever struggle with your emotional condition? And how many of your emotions are messed up? You're messed up. And if you follow your emotions, you better put your seatbelt on. Because you'll be on a roller coaster ride. You'll be up one day and down the next. But let me tell you, does your, does your, does your belief system uh, affect your emotional condition or state. Yes. And if your emotional state is bad, it probably is tied to your belief system. Amen. Who you listening to? Who you allow to speak into your life? Right. Who told you that? Right. You know, I couldn't help but think about Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, after they, you know, sinned, 
Because all before that, you know, God was coming down every day. And they were hanging out and walking in the cool of the day. And one day, God didn't change. They did. And God came down the day after they sinned the same way he came down the day before they sinned. And we think God changes. God doesn't change. You change in your thinking. I change in my thinking. And now, all of a sudden, I'm afraid of God. And God comes down just like he did the day before, right? And he said, Adam and Eve, where are you? Like you didn't know. He's like, where are you? I'm here. Just like I was just, I love you. I came to meet with you just like I did yesterday. And guess where he found them? Hiding. Trying to cover their nakedness. And they said, where are you? And they said, we hid because... We were afraid. Hello, Mephibosheth. We were afraid because we were naked. And then God says, who told you you were naked? Who are you listening to? Who, who are you listening to? Who are you letting speak into your life? So if you got people around you, kids, and they're telling you kids, you'll never do it. You can't go to college. Man, I'd be like jumping right up there and say, oh, you, we're not coming around you anymore. You're not going to tell my kids what they're going to do. My kids can do anything they set their mind to do. Amen? Amen. Yes. There is no limit for my kids to they so wrong as God. Amen? Amen. And I just tell every one of us, the only thing that limits any of us is our stinking thinking. Yes. Your attitude is going to determine your altitude. You got a stinking attitude, you're not going to go very far enough. And as long as you're a victim, you'll never be a victor. See, who are you listening to? Oh, you're just a victim. We're all victims of something. Let me just say this we all got a sad story. You know, I'll tell you my sad story, you tell me your sad story. But that's not what makes you special. What makes you special is when you let the grace of God empower you to rise above what happened to you. But you can choose what happens to you today. Amen. Amen. You can choose life today. God. But you got to watch who you let speak to you. Speak into you. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I'm give you some great advice. This needs to be our belief system. Right? Yeah. This is the foundation. See, not what other people say, not what your past says, not what your family sometimes says. And I'll tell you, sometimes the biggest hindrance could be your own family. You know, David even said, hey, I could have I endured this if it was my foe. But it was you, my brother. We go to church together. We break bread together. I mean, the ones that are the closest to you are often the ones that can hurt you the most. Wound you the most. And so, i got to keep going here because... So, so, like, your belief system will lead to your emotional state. So we go here, and this kind of a cycle. And then your emotional state, it, it, will, it will lead to uh, how you think, your thought process. How many know that that's where everything is, is kind of starts? Everybody say your thoughts? Well, that's, a, that's a you. Is that right? And your thoughts, how about this? Your thoughts are going to determine your, everybody say behavior. Behave your. Why do you act the way you act? Because of the way you think. Why do you think the way you think? Because of your emotional state. Why are you in that emotional state? Because that's what you've been listening to. And then your behavior is going to determine your results. Or how about this fruit? Or fruit. Let me tell you, if you're producing bad fruit, then that's just going to go right back up here and reinforce your bad belief system. Man, they're right. I'm in with them. I'm no good, you know. And it just, it's just a cycle of death. Or here's what we can do. We can change who we allow to be our belief system and what we allow to speak into our life. And so I'm done listening to that junk. I ain't listening to that anymore. I'm listening to my father. What he has to say about me, Amen. And so, anyway, how many think that's a that's a great thing? Because listen, as you.
think. So you'll be. And see, with them, Shaft, he's messed up in the head. He, and, and so, anyway, so let me keep going here. Because I started late, so I've got a few minutes left. So, anyway, so we've got Adam going on. You know, I, I couldn't help but think about the, the 12 spies that went in to spy out the land. Remember, they all came back. And, uh, Ten had a bad report, two had a good report. Two were listening to a wrong system. Or, I mean, ten were, but, but, but Jake, or Caleb, and Joshua, they said, we are the we be able group. How many want to be a part of the we be able group? But the other ten were the we be able not to group. Will we not be able? Was that how he said it? Not be able to group. How he said that? How many want to be a part of the we be able group? And what's going to determine that is right here. Who are you listening to? And you know what they said? They, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. And so my enemy saw me as a grasshopper. Do you know how you perceive yourself? It's the perception other people will have of you. If you see yourself as a grasshopper, your enemy is going to squash you. But if you see yourself as a child, a son, a daughter of the Most High God, seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, and over all the rulers of the darkness, amen, you're going to be squashed in the devil's head, amen. You gotta get to the palace. Amen. You gotta take your place yes. at the king's table if you're gonna rule and reign. And there's too many Christians on their way to heaven still living in Lodabar. And let me just talk about Lodabar real quick. The word Lodabar, <laughs> I mean, kind of like the bar's really low. I just thought about that. I don't even read that. The bar is really low. But that's really what it means. You know, I looked it up. It means land of nothing. Anybody been there? If you've been on meth, you're headed to the land of nothing. That's right. Because it'll take everything you got. Right. Sometimes even your underwear. And socks. And I'm not joking. And I'm not, it's not funny. But load of art means land of nothing. Listen, it means wasteland. It means wilderness. How about this? Listen. It means to be uncultivated. Can I tell you guys? There's a lot of good ground all over the city, but it's uncultivated. It wasn't created to be barren, wilderness. It was created to bring forth good fruit. But they're living in Lodabar, uncultivated. Not producing fruit. Not producing the things that God put them here to produce. How many feel like there was a time in your life you knew there had to be more, you knew there was something more, but you were uncultivated, you were living in Lodabar. And so, Lodabar, that is, it, it means uncultivated, which makes you unfruitful. It means to be empty. And let me tell you, when you get in Lodabar, it'll paralyze you because you live in fear. How many of y'all believe that every day, like uh, Mephibosheth was thinking, I wonder if this is the day Dave's going to find me and I'm going to die. And how many of like fear will paralyze you and keep you from being fruitful? All those things happen in Lodabar. And so I just, I just want you to use your imagination here a little bit. And let's just go to Lodabar. Let's go to Mephibosheth. And, you know, maybe he's probably got some of his servants watching out all the time. I mean, he's looking over his shoulder. The wicked man flees when no one pursues. And he's looking, and all of a sudden, the servants come back. I'm just, use your imagination a little bit. And, and, and the chefs in the house, and the servants are out watching out, and they see the dust coming from horses. And, and the word comes, it's David's men. It's David's soldiers. What do you think is going through the chef's mind? Go, oh, this is it. My life's over. If I go to church, the church is going to burn down. I need to strike. I mean, there's people out there that really believe that. And, and it's like, he thinks it's terrible. He thinks it's bad. He thinks he's going to die, doesn't he? Because this is the king, and I'm the, only, I'm, I'm the only one left at Jonathan's house that has a, that could be an heir to the throne, and he's coming to take me out. I'm going to stink and thank you. And that's how a lot of people are with God. And the only way that's going to change is somebody goes and tells them 
the good news of the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God is not mad at you. God's not coming after you to kill you. He's coming after you to carry you to the palace. Think it, think it. Man, if people could hear this, they'd say, man, I ain't running from it. I'm running to it. Amen, Amen. not from it. So, so David went after him. And I couldn't help but think David's a type of Jesus and our Father. And how many know, and I couldn't help but think of the love of the song, Reckless Love. I mean, that was a real controversial song, but I like that song. And I'm glad that God was a little reckless with his love. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad that God came after me. And I'm glad that God lit up every dark place. And I'm glad that God knocked down every wall that stood in the way. Amen? And I'm glad. Yes, he left the 99 and went and found it. Put, how many know? How many know? But then the chef couldn't get there on his own. Because it's crippled. You can't get there on your own. We've all been crippled. And we need God to come. Amen. And put us on his shoulders. And take us back to the palace. And say, you're staying with me. From now on. And eating at my table. Amen. That's my God. Amen. Amen. And they need to know that out there. And guess what? We represent our great God. Amen. We are those servants he's sending out. To go get them. And Amen. bring them to the Father's house. Go get them. You have to compel it because they're the thing. Now, that's too good to be true, but it is. That's why they call it good news, amen, the gospel. And so, reckless love. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up. No wall you won't kick down. No lie you won't tear down. Amen. Come on after me, God. Amen. He comes after you, don't he? Amen. Let me tell you, he is relentless. Anybody ever backslide? And the whole time I was back to four years, he did not leave me alone. And I wanted him to leave me alone. I'm like, man, God, don't you know I'm messing up? And he would just find ways to, to let me know I still love you. I'm here for you. And I'm like, how could you do this, God? For a dead dog like me, just like a little shack. And he said, no, I love you. And I got a place waiting with your name on Father's house. Amen? Amen. So let's bring this in for land. <coughs> and then and then just think about this, you guys. And I'm done. 45 minutes. Uh, so here's what here, here comes the soldiers, the army, the cloud of dust, and the finish of thinking, my life's over. But what he doesn't know, his life is just about to begin. Amen. Death's not coming, life's coming. And when they get there, he thinks he's going to die. And they said, Mr. Bishop, you're coming with me. And he probably thinks the whole way, I'm just going to kill me over there. And how many know he's in for a great surprise? And I don't have time to really get into all that. But in one day, it was in one day, in one moment, one day, you guys, just like some of y'all, one day, he went from the land of nothing, the wilderness, to the palace, one day. It's called mercy. It's called grace. It's called love. It's called forgiveness. And he went from the wilderness to the palace in one day. He has translated us out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Boom, just like that. Born again. Okay? And so isn't that a beautiful thing? Beautiful thing. One day, what made it possible was a covenant. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus became the author of the new covenant and said, Now whoever wants to come to my table can come. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, how low, how dark, how bad, I'm telling you, you can come by the blood of the Lamb. There's a place at the table for you. Your daddy's got a seat right beside you. With your name on Okay? And I want to close with one of my favorite passages. And that's Ephesians. And I'm just going to, we're going to read it. And then I'm going to sing a song. We're going to close. But, you know, and what I, my goal is all the time 
to, to bring us to the palace, to get us seated with Christ in heavenly places. Can I read this to you? Real quick. You guys, this is us. Now you can go ahead and read verses 1 through 4, which, like we were all dead in our trespasses and sin, and we're all by nature children of wrath. Let me say amen to that. Amen. Being led by the lust of this world, and we're by nature children of wrath. How many know by nature we should have been judged and condemned? But we get to verse 4, and it says, And he made alive those who were dead. Let, let, let go back to it, because I'll just read it, and then we'll stop. Go backwards to one. Sorry. He's awesome. And you he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses, and that's us, you guys, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and were by nature, you were naughty by nature, okay. <laughs> and were by nature children of what? Just as others. When you hear my two favorite words in the whole Bible, everybody say, but. But God. But God. That's a holy God. But God. Hello, Mephibosheth. He's thinking, I'm done. I'm toast. I'm judged. Wrath is coming. But God, who is rich in his mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, and our sins has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And are you ready for this? And has raised us up together and made us sit together with him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. Yeah. You guys see that you know? That is a place. If you go back and read this morning. Go back to chapter 1, verses 18, 19, 20. It talks about Jesus and how he was seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness, and heavenly places. And guess what? He said, now, you come and sit beside me. It is a place of authority. It is a place of power. It is a place where you were created to rule. That's royalty. That's why I wanted you to read what you read, Princess. Amen? And I mean that we are kings and queens of the God. Amen. We have royal blood flowing through our veins. We have been seated in the palace with our great God and Father. Amen? And he has given you all authority in heaven and earth. Amen? To trample on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen? and stop looking in that old mirror of the world and say, this is who I am. This is going to be my belief system from now on. I'm going to believe what the Bible says about me, amen? And I'm going to rise up and I am going to go possess my land. My inheritance in Jesus' name. Let's do that. Let's, let's stand up. And here's what I saw us doing. If you want to take this board for me, guys. And, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and I, I just kind of see this as kind of a prophetic act or whatever you want to say. Because one of the things that I kind of got away from is you hear a word preached. You hear a word preached, and the people just shoot right out the door. And that's okay. If you want to do that, that's fine. But I want us to respond. Here's what I saw us doing as a prophetic act. Is, and, and, you know, what happens after that's up to you. But, you know, we'll have people up here to pray and stuff like this. But how many of us sometimes we need to respond to God's word? So what I, I'm going to play this song, and it's like, it's, it's like, I am who you say I am. Amen? I'm mean, going to believe you are who he says you are. And if he says you're righteous, you're righteous. Amen? If he says you're his kid, you're his kid. And stop listening to those other voices. Amen? We get the right perception of who God says you are. And here's what I see us doing. You know, I don't know where y'all's at, but there's a place at his table. His table's right up here. Okay, we're going to believe his table's right up here. What I saw us doing is moving from Lodabar to the palace. And I believe by just simply 
you stepping out of your seat, you don't have to do anything, you come over and over, but by you stepping out of your seat this morning and just walking up here around this altar, you're saying to God, God, I'm, I'm leaving go to bar behind, amen? I'm leaving stinking thinking behind. I'm leaving what everybody said about me behind. I'm leaving all that crud behind that tried to push me into a box and define me. It ain't going to define me anymore. I'm coming home to my father, amen? I'm coming home to take my place. And so if that's you this morning and you want to just surrender to Jesus and say, you can't come on your own, it's by the power of God. It's not by mind. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Let me tell you. It's in the wrong place. In my father's house, there's a place for me. Can you put those words up there? I'm a child.
the name of Jesus. And Lord, let there be light released in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just declare over them the truth is going to be known and the truth is going to set Alicia free. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And she's going to rise up to fulfill her destiny. We speak that over her as a musician, as a piano player, as a drummer. And Lord, we command devil, take your hands off right now in the name of Jesus. Release her right now with every spirit of infirmity and every lying, deceiving spirit. Go right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, come all over. Angels of the Lord, in camp round about. Tiger and Linda, and especially Alicia. All times, angels of the Lord, in camp around. Let your presence just fill the room where she's at right now. Darkness, you got to go right now. you got to go right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, any wrong belief system, crush it in Jesus' name. Let the word of God come alive. The truth of God's word set her free. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We love you guys. We love you guys.